Well, hey, everybody, welcome back to Church Online. This is Gateway Victory Church, and my name is Rowan. Together with my wife, Mara, and a great team of leaders, we're creating a church together for life-changing God encounters. And here, during a time when there aren't very many in-person services around, what we're doing is we're doing church in our homes and in host homes. And so thank you for gathering with us this morning. Today, we've got a great lineup. We're going to do some praise and worship, open our hearts up to the Lord. Then there's going to be a kids component and uh, resources on our website for kids as well. And then we're going to jump into the Word of God together and pray together. It's going to be a great time. Let's prepare our hearts by praying. And uh, before we do that, if you could let us know that you're there by uh, commenting in the comments below, say hi, let's engage together, ask some questions, give some praise reports. How about uh, some prayer requests, anything you like that in the comments, that'd be great. And uh, let's go ahead and pray. And we're going to jump into our time together this morning. Father, in Jesus' name. We welcome you right where we are, whether we're sitting in armchairs and couches in a living room or in a vehicle or wherever we are. God, we open up our hearts before you right now. Father, in this praise and in this worship that you would come, that you would be here with us wherever we are, uniting us together around this service and around this worship and the word that we share and the prayers that we pray. Father, we thank you for that. Thank you, God, that we can encounter you here and that in doing so, it changes our lives. We thank you for it, Father. In Jesus' name, everybody agreed, said, amen. Well, be blessed this morning. Enjoy the service.
God is with us.
shelter of Almighty's love, in the safety of the Savior's arms. I have found myself hiding place. I have found myself a secret space in the shelter of Almighty's love 
in the safety of the Savior's arms. I will run to the highway. I will run to the hiding place. Draw me ever closer to look upon your face. I will run to the hiding place. I will. So I'll run to you, Jesus, now. Yes, I will. I run to you. I have found myself a hiding place. I have found myself a secret space. In the refuge of the Father's care. In the cleansing blood of Jesus there. So I will run to the hiding place. I will run to the hiding place. Oh, draw me ever closer. I will run to the hiding place. Yes, I will. I want to run. I want to run to you. I want to run to you. Oh, though my fears, though my fears may overwhelm me. Troubles they surround. Though the wind rise up to take me, my hiding place is already found. Though my fears, though my fears may overwhelm me, the troubles they surround. Though the wind rise up to take me, my hiding place is already.
are you today? It's good to see you. Hey, Karis, it's good to see you. It's good to see you, you Rosie. Oh, why, well, thank you. Hey, Karis, what have we been talking about lately? Jesus and his disciples. Jesus and his disciples. And what kind of things does Jesus do for his disciples? He teaches them. He teaches them. About the kingdom. About the kingdom. Oh, that's good. And Jesus gives us a new identity. Identity and purpose. Yeah. And purpose. And remember, we had the heart pillow. What was that all about? Loving. That's right. Jesus loves us? Yep. Absolutely. He sure does. And what did we learn last week? He prayed. He prays for us. That's right. Yeah. And Jesus tells his disciples about the future. He wants to tell you about the future in your future. Um, Jesus empowered his disciples with his... Remember, he told them to go out and, and they could do miracles in his... In his name. Yeah. That's right, in his name. Yeah, so Jesus did a whole bunch of things for his disciples. And what are we going to talk about today, Rosie? Um, well, yeah, Jesus appeared to his disciples. Like, after he rose from the dead, he appeared to them. Yeah. And sometimes it was just like, ta-da, Jesus just appeared, just like that. Hey, Jesus. Hi, Jesus, you just appeared. That's pretty cool. Jesus appears to his disciples. That's right. Yeah. yeah, he appeared to his disciples. You know, he did that a lot. He did that, he did that at least four or five times after he rose from the dead and he appeared to his disciples. Just like he just appeared just right now. <laughs> That's pretty fun, eh? Yeah. Yeah. So, like when right after he rose from the dead, he appeared to two ladies and that they were going, they were just the, the angel had sent them and said, Go tell the disciples that Jesus is alive. Yeah, and then the just, Jesus just showed up, and he said, hey, it's me. And yeah, and then the ladies, they knew that it was him, and then they told Jesus, that they, they told the disciples, the other disciples, that they had seen Jesus, right? Yeah, and how about when, when Jesus came to two disciples on the road? Yeah, he was walking on the road. Can you show us, Karis, walk on the road? Yeah, Jesus just just walking on the road, and there were two disciples, and they didn't even recognize him, the Bible says, and then Jesus taught them about Everything in the scriptures that talked about Jesus and why he came, and how he came, and what he had to do. And they were just walking that whole time, right? Yeah, yeah. And then all of a sudden, when they stopped with him, and they then, yeah, then they, they finally figured out that it was Jesus when he disappeared. So like, that's like, poof, disappeared. Just the opposite of, of appearing. Disappeared, right? Yeah, the opposite. But Jesus appeared, so I think we'll keep him here. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, yeah. And then Jesus... All once after he rose from the dead, all the disciples got together in the upper room, and then poof, Jesus appeared right in the middle of them. Yeah, just bang, just like that. Yeah, and th that the disciples were really, really scared. And he said, "Hey, don't worry about it. It's just me." And he showed them who he was, and then he ate some fish, and, and then the disciples were very happy that it was Jesus. And again, Jesus was. He told them all about himself, and he told them why he was going to come and what was going to happen. Right. So Jesus just appeared to his disciples, but what's really neat is that Jesus wants to appear to us, to you and to me. Really? Yeah. He wants to appear to you, yeah. And he does all the time, right? Jesus says in the Bible that he is with us all the time. He says, I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to forsake you. That's just another word for leave. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll be with you all the time. And how is he with us all the time? You know, how is he with us, Karis? Do we see him all the time with our eyes? I don't. Well, except for you, Jesus. <laughs> Do we see Jesus with our eyes all the time? Not really, right? Yeah. Sometimes Jesus shows up, and actually he, is, he has been showing up to people all the time. He showed up to the Apostle Paul, and this was even after Jesus went back up into heaven. He showed up to Paul on the road to Damascus. Paul was riding a horse, and he was going to go persecute some Christians. And then Jesus showed up, and Paul is explaining about that later when he was in front of one of the kings, um, the King Agrippa, I think it was. And um, yeah, he just said, and Jesus appeared to me, and he said, Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? That's right. Yeah, that's exactly what he said, Rosie. And then Paul said, who are you? Because it was just like a bright light. 
And Jesus said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And so Paul totally changed his life around, and he went on to write most of the New Testament that we have today, right there. Yeah, mostly from written from Paul. Right, Karis? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So Jesus appeared to his disciples, and he appears to us today, but we don't always see him with our eyes. How does he appear to us, and how do we know that he is with us? Karis, do you know? I know. You do? Rosie? Yeah. Jesus said, he said that he was going to be with us. So should we believe him when he said that? Yes. Yes, he, we should believe him, right? Because we believe every time he says something. Exactly. We should believe that thing. That's right, because Jesus is the truth, right? Yeah. That's right. He said, he never, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He never tells lies. He never tells lies, does he? No, that's for sure. So if he said he was going to be with us all the time, should we believe him? Yeah, I think so. I think we should. Yeah, and you guys can practice. You can practice like when you're praise and worship, that's an easy time to practice. You practice and you just spend time focusing on Jesus and you'll be able to feel him. Right? Have you ever felt him, Karis? Have you ever felt his presence? Yeah. Yeah, and what does it feel like? It feels like... It feels... Hard. Hard? Down, down, down in your heart right here? Mm -hmm. Yeah? And it feels like warm, right? Yeah. And it feels like, I know for me, it feels like my heart is really, really full, right? I can feel his presence very close, and it, it feels full in my heart. I don't know how else to describe it, but, but Jesus comes with his presence. And there's a verse that says where two or three are gathered in my name. In other words, they're coming together for Jesus. So like church, like every time we come to church, it says there I will be in the midst of you. I'll be with you, right there with you. Just like Jesus is right here. Right, Karis? Yeah. Yeah, just like that. And just like Rosie, like just like you're here. You're here in the midst of us. Karis, you're here in the midst of us. And Jesus is here in the midst of us now, right? Yeah, so when we get together in his name, Jesus is in the midst of us. All right, well, Zoe has a little clip, and she's going to teach us all about how to see and feel Jesus. Take it away, Zoe. Did you know Jesus wants to show himself to you? Jesus came to his disciples a number of times after he rose from the dead. Sometimes he came to them, and sometimes he just appeared out of nowhere. Just like that, there he was. Jesus even appeared to Paul after he went back to heaven, and he has appeared to many people since then, too. Most importantly, Jesus wants to appear to you. How does he do this? Well, some people have seen him with their eyes. But most of the time, Jesus is there in the spirit, and we can feel or sense his presence. We can learn to get better at sensing his presence, especially through worship and prayer, and just spending time with him. Remember, Jesus told his disciples he would never leave them or forsake them. And that's true for you, too. He also said that where two or three of us are gathered in his name, he will be there with us even today. Remember that Jesus wants you to know that he's there with you. He wants you to feel him. Let's ask him today. Dear Jesus, you have said that you are always with me. I want to feel your presence more and more. Help me to know you are there. Show yourself to me. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you. Thank you, Zoe. That was great. And I know that Jesus is going to be with us all the time. I, can, I think I can even feel his presence right now. You can, Rosie? Yeah, Jesus is with us. Isn't he, Karis? Yeah. yeah, he is. And so even if you don't feel him or you don't see him, Jesus is still with you. And that's he is appearing to you and his presence is appearing to you as well, right? Okay. Hey, Karis, do you want to do a memory verse? Yeah. All right, let's do a memory verse. Okay, the memory verse this week is Matthew 28, 20. Can you say that? Matthew 28, 20. And Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he is saying, Lo, I am with you always. Lo, I am with you always. Even to the end of the age. Even to the end of the age. Hey, are we at the end of the age yet? No, because we're still here, right? Yeah, the earth is still here, and we're still going on. We haven't reached the end of the age yet, so that must mean that Jesus is still here with us today. All right, let's say that again. Matthew 28, 20. Matthew 28, 20. Lo, I am with you always. Lo, I am with you always. Even to the end of the age. 
even to the end of the age. Okay, can we say it one more time? Yeah? Okay, one more time. All right. Lo, I am with you always. Lo, I am with you always. Even to the end of the age. Even to the end of the age. All right, and that's it for today, boys and girls. See you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, hey, thank you, kids. What a wonderful uh, component there that you guys are adding to the service. Parents, take advantage of that material online that's there just for you and your kids. And so hope you enjoy that. And I want to take a moment just to say thank you for those of you that are sowing your finances into the kingdom of God through our church, that you're using this as soil that you're planting your finances into through regular, consistent, percentage-based giving. And uh, you might wonder how all that works. Well, details on your screen for how to give. And if you've been watching for a while, maybe you want to start doing that and just kind of giving towards our church. We would love it and appreciate it if you would. And besides, when you sow your finances into a church, when you give, you're sowing a seed. And the Bible says that that seed is like it goes into soil and it produces. And uh, your provision, your very provision is linked to your generosity to the kingdom of God. And so that's how it works to connect our finances with the economy of heaven. In fact, we have a prayer and we're going to pray it now over our finances. Again, thanks to those of you that are giving towards our church, even during this very uncertain time. It enables us to keep on doing what we're doing. And so thank you very much. And let's pray this prayer together over our finances. Are you ready? Let's go. I sow my finances into the kingdom of God. Every penny will produce for God and for me. The gospel will be preached and lives will be changed and bodies will be healed and Satan will be stopped. It will produce for me good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. Will God give back to me through the hands of men that I may give again? I count it as done in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. We'll be blessed in all your coming and going and all your vacationing and staycations. Be blessed in all that you set your hand to this summer. We believe that God has great things for us, that he is with us on our journey, and that includes our financial journey. Amen. If you've been looking for work or you need better work or you're noticing a shift or a change in the way that money comes to you, we pray a blessing and the guidance of God over you for that as well. During this time of incredible change, let the changes of God come. Amen. That's our prayer for you. Be blessed. Well, our discussion has led us to the book of Colossians. We've been looking at what it takes to follow Christ, which really, according to Matthew 7.24, just means simply that we hear what God wants us to do, and then we do it in our lives, which sounds simple, but we confuse it, and we can get it quite complicated if we're, if we're not careful. But it's led us to the book of Colossians. And so if you've got a Bible with you, or you might want to Google this up on a device, but go ahead and go to Colossians chapter 2. We're going to bounce around in Colossians a little bit more because we've been seeing that the way that we think about what God is telling us to do, those things that we think that God wants us to do in our lives, the way that we think about them and ourselves in that context has everything to do with our sticking to it and with our follow through and with us actually making the changes that God wants us to make. And so go to Colossians chapter 2. This has been really good. I hope it's been blessing you. In fact, I want to pray again for the Spirit of God to come and reveal His will and to reveal His ways to us today as we look at these verses from Scripture. Can we do that? Maybe just close your eyes or keep your heart open right now and agree with this prayer. But Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray right now that Spirit of God, you would lead us into truth, that God, the eyes of our understanding would be open today in a new way and in a new measure to what it is that we're meant to do in our lives, to what it is that you have for us in the future. God, I pray for everybody uh, that's listening today and everybody that's tracking with these messages, God, that your spirit would lead us into those things that you want to do in Jesus' name. And we thank you for it, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Say amen if you agree with that prayer. Amen. Well, let's go to Colossians chapter 2, verse 2. Colossians chapter 2, I'm sorry, in verse 6. Colossians 2, verse 6. Here's what it says. It says, as therefore you have received Christ. He's talking to church. He's talking to believers like you and me and people that are obviously probably looking into what believers are believing. And he's speaking to all those people together. And he's saying, listen, you can receive Christ. That's one thing. But it's another thing to walk in Christ is what this verse goes on to say. And so he says, you know, as you have received Christ, 
And I just want to pause that for a moment because if you've been thinking about receiving Jesus and making him the Lord of your life, I just want to encourage you in something. You know, regardless of the uncertainty all around you, maybe in different arenas or all across your life, the uncertainty in your life, maybe, maybe some of the struggle or the pain or the sorrow in your life, right in the midst of all of that, you can use it as a driver towards getting closer to God. And, and the step that you may need to take today is to personally receive the Lord Jesus Christ. See, when Jesus came, he came and he gave us a gift, and he gave us the gift of abundant life, as we're going to look at. And the only way to live fullness of life is to receive the Lord Jesus. Jesus came to repair the breach, to repair the relationship that you and I have with God. And of course, he did that by taking the punishment of all of the wrongdoing in the world and all of our own wrongdoing. He took the punishment upon himself by sending his son to die for us and creating a way for us to have relationship with the Father again. And here's how it works. You receive Christ. You say, Father, in Jesus' name, I come before you right now, and I make you, Jesus, the Lord of my life. God, I receive you into my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you pray that prayer or something similar, that wording around that prayer, and you open your heart up to God, we would love to hear about it. You can get a hold of me right in the comments below or personally at hello at gatewayvictory.com. I'd love to hear from you because that starts a journey in your life towards fullness, towards all that God has planned for you. I'd love to chat with you more about it. But here's what this verse says, Colossians 2.6. It says, as you've received Christ, so walk in him. You can see that there in your Bibles. That's what it says. As you've received the Lord, Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. In other words, we've received him. Now that causes us to live a certain way, to walk through the journey of life. And the Bible is replete with ex examples of how our walking through life or how our living life is going through a journey. And it's walking down a path. There's a direction that we're going in our lives. And it says, as we've received Christ, so walk in him, which is really interesting wording, isn't it? Because in there is a bit of a mystery that we're going to begin to unpack over this week and next week of what it means to walk in him. Because really, if we look at this at face value, this scripture here that says, as you've received Christ, so walk in him. He's not saying here, as you've received Christ, now go live however you want to live or just do what seems best to you. And he's not saying, now that you've received Christ, here is a long list of rules and regulations that you better make sure that you do. That's not what he's saying. Nor is he saying, just you know, to make a point, he's not saying, as you've received Christ, right, become a God follower. Some of your friends and people that know you as a God follower, they might say that you're religious. But he doesn't say this. Now that you have received Christ, go be the judge of other people and of how they should live. He doesn't say any of those things. It says, as you've received Christ, so walk in him. In other words, hear what God wants you to do in your life and then implement those directives directly into your life. Become a follower of the way that Christ wants you to live, but do it in him, in Christ. This is a mystery, and, and the scripture talks many times about us being in Christ in addition to Christ being in us. We're going to look at this a little bit deeper here. Let's go to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. And this is the opener of this letter um, to the church. And, and, uh, and the writer, Paul, the apostle Paul, here's what he says. He says, I'm praying for you. And here's what he's praying. He says that you would be filled. This is in verse 9, second part of the verse. That you would be filled with the knowledge of his will. I want us to stop there for a moment. It is possible for you and me to be filled with the knowledge of God's will. Let's look at that. Let's look at the, the wording around that. It says to be filled. This means, and, and I looked it up and just kind of run some searches, this word filled, it's translated filled. In the original manuscript, it means, it means if you like two different senses to it, it means being crammed full. <laughs> How many of you have recently written an exam or taken some extra training and had to, had to be examinated on it, and you found yourself in this mode as, Maybe, you've, you, maybe you're in school, junior high and high school, and, and you know what this is well like to study all night and to be crammed full of that information. It means to be packed, to be filled. That It is possible for you and I to be filled with the knowledge of God's will for us to be, just for us to, just for us to have it so in us that we are, we are 
tight with the knowledge of God's will, filled with the knowledge of God's will. <laughs> another another uh, sense on this word it is to be furnished. You know how you would walk into a house and it'd be like completely empty? Well, the opposite of that, where it's furnished. And uh, when it, you know, because it's the knowledge of God's will, let's call it furnished in a, in a beautiful beautiful way, just to create an incredible atmosphere and a great setting. Your life, your mind, your awareness of what it is that you're meant to do, imagine that. Imagine it being furnished, like fully furnished, where there's no deficit, where there's no lack, where there's no holes or gaps. Imagine you being filled with what it is your creator, the one who knows you the best, wants you to do and how he wants you to operate in life. And so it says to be filled with the knowledge of his will. Let's look at that word knowledge. It means a recognition of what God's will is. To recognize what it is that God would want you to do. A recognition of the will of the Father for you. It means discernment. So that you would be able to look at all the pros and the cons of a given situation. All the challenges in a situation and maybe the easy routes and the harder routes through it. And as you're looking at it, you have this discernment that's going on, a spiritual processing, if you will, that helps you discern what God would want, helps you discern the things that God is after in those situations and in your life. Imagine being filled, furnished, fully furnished. Imagine it being crammed into your mind. Imagine knowing what it is that God wants you to do, recognizing it, discerning it. That word knowledge also means an acknowledgement where you can look at a situation, maybe you're looking even at something in culture, Maybe you're looking at something that your friends are going through or maybe in your own life and you can acknowledge, you know what, of all the uncertainty here and of all the things I'm not sure about, I acknowledge that that is God, that God is operating here. God is doing something in my life or through my life or in society that I acknowledge that. Imagine you being filled with all knowledge, discernment, acknowledgement, recognition of what it is that God wants to do, his will, all right, his will, filled with all knowledge of his will. This, this, you know, simply put, and I think we know this, but listen to this description of this word, the knowledge of God's will. This means God's wishes, God's desires in your life. It means the determination of God in a situation. What God determines should and could happen in any situation that you're facing and, and anything that's going on in and around your life in the situations and circumstances, what are God's wishes? What are God's desires? What is the determination in the heart of God for that situation? Come on, think about, think about the things in your life right now. This word also means God's choice. You ever had a dilemma, not sure what to do? You ever wondered this way or that way? What's God's choice? Being filled with the knowledge of God's Choice. You know what also it means? It means the inclination of God's heart. That the, what God would prefer, the inclination, the, the desire of God. Come on, I want this for you like I want it for me, for us to be filled with the knowledge of his will. I want to be filled with that. And here's what I'm finding, and, and, I, and I present this to you because maybe this is something God is putting his finger on in your life as well. But I'm noticing in this technology-filled, information-filled, in this very full life, in this social media-packed kind of existence, bombarded all the time with all kinds of information from culture and from um, just, just everything that's going on, maybe especially during this time when there's so much news and, and so much change and, and so much of it is fascinating and troubling and really on a core level can cause fear on the inside of our hearts Listen to me for a moment. Filled with the knowledge of God's will, it costs us something. Here's what I'm realizing. It's meaning saying no to that show or no to that entertainment time or no to that radio station or no to that social media platform or no to so much screen time. It, it has a cost to it is what I'm saying. That there's a cost to being filled, to leaning towards, to saying, God, I want you to fill me with the knowledge of your will. I want to recognize what it is you want me to do. And I want to go ahead and do it as I walk in Christ. To understand that and to know that, it means saying no to some things so that you can say yes to God's will and to God's ways and to understanding what he wants you to do. 
more and more. And so ask the Lord about, learn to ask the Lord about different situations in your life. And this is maybe a new thought for you. But learn to ask the Lord because you can talk to the Lord just like anybody else down through church history or Bible history has talked to the Lord. You can go ahead and talk to the Lord. Start a conversation with him around these lines. You pick a situation or a circumstance, something that you're facing, something a loved one is facing in your life, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe a real challenge or something that's been really hard for you lately. And you say this, and you say, God, can you show me what you want? God, can you show me what you want here? Come on. Situations can be so complex. They can be so fraught and they pl- with, with fears and with, with, with our hopes or with our dreams. Situations that we would pick out of, our, out of, out of our, our lives and we begin to look at them and begin to examine them. You know, many times our escapes from life are to, are to shy away from and escape from things that we don't even want to think about because it's too confusing or too fearful or it's too unsettling. But what about being able to hold those situations? Before the Lord and to say, God, what do you want here? God, what do you want in this situation? Come on, this is so important. This is so important. We refer to a scripture here in our church a lot because I believe that it is something that um, God is um, speaking and shouting. I think the wisdom of God is shouting this. And it's in John chapter 10, verse 10. And this, these are the words of Jesus. And I love how he clarified these things for us. But in John chapter 10, thinking about what does God want, in John chapter 10, verse 10, it says the thief does not come, and you're going to have to take my word for it or, you know, jump into this passage and look at some context, but he's talking about um, shepherding, you know, shepherding sheep, and he says the thief does not come. Take my word for it. This is the enemy. This is the spiritual opposition that is against you and against your walk in Christ, make no mistake about it, as John Eldridge says, that when you were born, you were born into a world at war. We are in a war zone down here on the earth, and we are, as believers in Jesus, enforcing his victory, just like Jesus did in every situation and circumstances that we come in contact with, that we have influence over. We have the ability to bring the kingdom of God at all times and in every way because of the authority that God has given us as his sons and as his daughters. We're, that, that's what we're meant to be doing. But we have a spiritual enemy, and Jesus said this, the thief comes, the spiritual enemy comes, he does not come, except to steal and kill and destroy. I began to think about this, and I thought, you know what, Jesus doesn't say he just comes to make a mess of things. You know, he didn't just say these words as like, almost like saying the same thing over three times, but he said, steal, kill, and destroy. Steal, kill, and destroy. And I got to thinking about it, about how that's so true in our lives, that the enemy will come and he'll try to steal our peace. He'll try to steal our joy. He'll try to steal success in a relationship. He'll try to steal our families out from underneath us. He'll try to steal the provision that God has created for us. He'll kind of try to steal the destiny that is upon our lives through words that are spoken, through curses and different um, demonic attacks that are put on us. Come on, it's true. The enemy comes to steal. And the reason he does that is because he wants to kill us. In the Bible, you know, you can often look at death as a, not just a physical death, although obviously it means that, but a spiritual separation from God, where death is me living separated from God. And so I can be dead, though alive, right? Do you understand what I mean? I can be living a life, but all the joy and all the life and all the energy and all the hope has been stolen from me. And we get pushed down, down, down in our lives. By the enemy. He comes to steal. He comes to kill, separate us from God. And you know, ultimately that results in a physical death, and we know that. And the enemy wants us out of the way. The enemy wants us dead. You know, if the enemy can't stop you from following the Lord Jesus, he wants you out of the way. He wants you nullified. He wants you, he wants to mute your influence in the world. That's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to kill it and he wants to separate you from God. And you know why? Because he wants to destroy your legacy. He wants to destroy your influence of the kingdom of God through other people. For you are one in whom life dwells. The life from God dwells in you if you've received the Lord Jesus Christ, as we're going to see. It says here, the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That is the enemy's plan on the earth and over your life and over your family. But Jesus said, I have come that you may have life, that you may possess life, that you may have it and hold it, that it would be yours, as we're going to see from the book of Colossians here. 
It says that God has come to give you life. If you've received the Lord Jesus Christ, you have the life of God on the inside of you. So Jesus said, I have come that you may have life. And then he says, life more abundantly. That's what that verse goes on to say. He says, life and to have it more abundantly. That has a violence to it in that, in that wording. It has an abundance and a fullness and a violence to it in that it is the life that is on the inside of you that is a lifeline for the people that are around you. That's the way that Christianity works. God has us here on the earth full of himself to display his goodness to the people around us. That's why God has us here. And so here's what we need to think about when we think, God, what do you want here? There's a diagnosis that comes in from the doctor and it's pretty grave. God, what do you want here? There's someone that's struggling in their finances or struggling just in their career and in their choices. God, what do you want here? It, see, we need to learn to ask about every situation in our lives. There's a struggle in a marriage or a struggle in a, in a family, and, and the, there's just strife that has come in, and there's harsh words that are spoken. God, what do you want here? Where there's brokenness and where there's broken expectation and broken dreams, where, where, where a life is shattered by the, by, the, by the hand of the enemy. God, what do you want? And when we come to discern what the knowledge of his will is, what God wants, then you and I are equipped and empowered to enforce it in those situations that are in our lives, that we have spiritual authority, that are in our spheres of influence around us. Come on, we want to know his will, not just so that we can say, you know what, when we all get to heaven, that's going to be wonderful to have it up there. No, we know his will so that we can apply his will by faith in every situation. And in every circumstance, let's go back to the book of Colossians, because we need to ask over areas of our lives. You know, if there's a habit that's just dogging you, that's just still in your life, maybe, 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 maybe swearing or maybe negativity or maybe um, a habit that, you know, just a physical habit in your life, yet alone thought pattern habits or a spirit of rejection over you. We need to ask ourselves, God, what do you want? God, I'm willing to embrace. I want you to do this right now. Be willing to embrace, maybe for the first time in a long time, maybe for the first time ever, the answer to the question, God, in this area of pain, in this area of struggle, God, what do you want? And then to weed out of your life those influences that would fill that space with other things, the ways that you escape, the ways that you don't think about it, the ways that you fill your mind with other things. Come on, to wean yourself off of those and say, God, I want to be filled with the knowledge of your will. That's a great question to ask. God, what do you want? And here in that verse, in Colossians 1, verse 9, it says this, that we would be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding and all wisdom and spiritual understanding you know what wisdom is in the scripture whenever you see this in the book of proverbs and corinthians and here again in the book of colossians it talks about the wisdom of god or spiritual wisdom and understanding this word wisdom means the ability to live life skillfully right i mean it means it means to take the resources and the ability and the strength and the time that you have and to live life skillfully with intention and with discipline in your life, spiritual wisdom, the ability to live life skillfully. I'm sure you don't have to look very far into friends or family members and you say, you know what, that just wasn't very bright. It just wasn't very skillful. You, know, you can probably look back in your own life. Like I can look back in mine and say, you know what, that I just wasn't very skillful. <laughs> Listen, from a spiritual perspective, we get to live our lives successfully and skillfully. Spiritual wisdom and understanding, spiritual wisdom and understanding. And he goes on to say that you may walk worthy of the Lord, pleasing him in all you do, pleasing him in all you do. Imagine, fruitful in every good work, right out of Psalm chapter one, fruitful in every season of your life. So ask the Lord, God, what do you want here? God, what do you want here? 
even over the three directives, maybe you've begun to pen these or journal these, or you've, maybe you've got three things written down. This is the challenge that I've been putting out for several weeks now to say, God, you know, as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, God, what do you want me to do in my life so that I can build a life and build a, a legacy here on the earth with the, the time and the energy and the resources that I have left? God, what is your will for me? And of all the long list of things you might be able to guess that the Lord wants you to do, to pick three things that God wants you to do now, here, here. And in this season, I tell you what, we prayed over last Tuesday night for all of you that are beginning to think those things and write those things down. We began to pray for you that there would be a spirit of grace and anointing and ability over you. Some of you trying to stop things. Some of you trying to start things. Some of you trying to let go of things that have did it just clouded your life, been a shadow over your life for years and years and years? We are praying for the changes of God over your life. And as you begin to contemplate these things, I want you to ask the Lord, God, in this area, God, what do you want me to do? And don't allow yourself, don't allow yourself the luxury, as it were, the seeming luxury, as it were, of concluding, you know what, I think I know what God would want, but he probably wants that for someone else and not me. And so, therefore, I can just go ahead and live the way that I want to live. Mm -mm. Allow the discomfort, allow the pain, Allow the hurt of God, I think you want this for me. This would be abundant life, but I don't have it, and I don't see it, and I don't know how to get there. Allow yourself the discomfort of putting up as a mirror the word of God that says, I have this for you, and allow yourself that pain. Allow yourself the contrast between what God is speaking to you that he wants and what you actually have. And then say, God, if you want this for me, God, I'm asking you to show me how to walk in Christ, even as I have received him. How to walk in him, even as I have received him. Listen, once you understand what God wants for you, that's where faith is birthed. That's where faith is sparked on the inside of you. And faith and patience, the Bible says in James 1, are the power twins that will get the job done and you will be lacking nothing. Hear me out. Stand before the Lord. Sit before him in the morning and say, God, what do you want? In this situation I'm facing at work, my finances and my health and my life, God, what would you want? What is normal here for the kingdom of God? God, show me what you want. And when he shows you according to the abundant life that he has promised you, when he shows you, say, God, I want that too. I want that too, and I will pray, and I will build my faith, and I will change what I say, and I will change my expectation, and I will walk in Christ even as I have received him in my life. Come on, church. I believe that this is what God wants us to do as we move through the end of the summer here in 2020. I believe there's so much that he has for us in the weeks and the months ahead as a church. And you know, as we begin to meet again regularly starting in September, stay tuned for details about that. I, I want this for you and I want this for me, that we would learn what it is that God wants and we would see the miraculous and we would see the change. Know that our prayers are with you and that our um, expectation of God is high for you and your walk in Christ. Praise the name of the Lord. Come on, let's go ahead and pray. Even right now, close your eyes with me if you're comfortable with that, but open your hearts and let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we believe you today for your anointing and your ability in us as we contemplate these changes, as we look at what it means to follow you in this broken world and in many areas of brokenness in our own lives. Father, we come before you to say, we're so thankful we've received you. God, now help us walk in you in Christ, not with a set of rules and standards that we still can't do anything about, but how to hear from you what you want us to do, what you want in our situations. Help us, God, to override all the other information in our, in our heads and in our hearts, Father, to come to a clear understanding what it is you want. Father, for those that are struggling with this, for those that it creates some angst and some, and some maybe surfaces some pain in their lives. Father, we ask you right now that they would be filled I ask that they would be filled with the knowledge of your will by the Holy Ghost and by the Spirit of God. Let them catch a glimpse of what you have for them. Even though the enemy has lied to them over and over and over and over again in their lives, that they would catch a glimpse 
of what the abundant life would be like for them, that the life that God has given them, that they hold it and have it on the inside, and it's just a matter of walking in Christ to see those things fulfilled. Father, I pray for the knowledge, the knowledge of your will for each and every one. And Father, I thank you for it. And I thank you, Holy Ghost, that you help us implement these things. Father, if there's been mistakes, if we've tried things and let them go, or if we've thought about it but we haven't followed through, we plead the blood over all those things in our lives. We thank you, Father, that the blood of Jesus, it reconciles us to God. It continually cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And here today, Father, we stand up in our faith. We wake up in our faith to live the abundant lives that you want us to live. And Father, we thank you for it. Do it now by your power. Allow the Spirit of God to come on you now in Jesus' name. Let the Holy Ghost come and stir Himself up on the inside of you now. Stir up the gift that is in you. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Come on, take a drink. Take a drink right now from the well. Take a drink from the well of life, which is in Christ Jesus, your Lord. Take a drink right now from the river of life that flows from the throne of God. For the Bible says everything will live where that river flows. Come on, take a drink right now. Turn your eyes, turn your hearts, turn your heads towards heaven. Right now, come on, receive the anointing of the Lord. Receive the ability of Almighty God over every situation and circumstance and everything on the inside of yourself. Even in your physical body now, I declare healing. And I declare, I declare freedom in your mind. I declare freedom in your mind right now to think the thoughts of Christ in Jesus' name by the power of the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Lord God. We declare fullness of life over our lives and over our church in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. We'll be blessed the rest of your day and the rest of your August and your summer. I hope you enjoy it. We'll see you during the week online somewhere, maybe around. And uh, if not that, then next Sunday right here. We'll talk to you soon.